My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. In a fast-paced, turbulent world, are you yearning for more peace, love, meaning, and embodied aliveness? Are you yearning for awakening? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Catherine Duncan, says this awakening is as close as your heart. Catherine Duncan is an integrative spiritual consultant. She is passionate about whole person healing. In her private practice, Learning to Live, she companions individuals who are struggling with chronic illness, life transitions, grief and loss, and those searching for more meaning and purpose. Catherine is also a consultant for Minnesota Personalized Medicine and Integrative Medical Practice in Minneapolis. Catherine is also a board-certified chaplain and certified spiritual director. Her website is learningtolive.org, and she joins me this week to share her path and book, Everyday Awakening, Five Practices for Living Fully, Feeling Deeply, and Coming into Your Heart and Soul. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Catherine Duncan. Welcome, Catherine. Great to meet you, Victor. Thank you. And you. Catherine, please share with us your early path including what happened when you were 11 years old and how that contributed to your awakening. When I was 11 years old, I was suddenly, actually was 10 turning 11, very ill. My parents took me to the hospital and soon after I was diagnosed with a very rare childhood cancer. I They told my parents, the doctors, that I had a 20% chance to live for two years and I, I mean, when I, they told me this, just that I had cancer, I'd never heard the word. I thought I'd go to the hospital and have to take like a Tylenol or something. So when I started at the hospital having chemotherapy and radiation and surgeries, it was pretty extreme. Um, and interestingly, that year that I was sick, a random, a drug came over that had not been used for the, for what I had. And my father demanded that they give me this chemotherapy drug. It's now standard treatment. Um, the survival rate for what I had is now 80%. So I'm grateful that my father had the insight to suggest and uh, demand that I have these drugs. But my life just cracked open. Uh, no one talked to me. This was in the 70s. They did have chaplains. No one talked to me. And my mother would say, I would be fine. You're going to be fine. And it was comforting, but there was no sense of reality of what I was experiencing. They had no anti-nausea drugs. They did a lot of amputation. It was very grim. And not long into starting treatments, I um, I started to pray. Faith, meant, faith had meant nothing to me, but I started to pray, could I please live to be 20 years old is what I prayed. And I told no one. And after praying and praying and praying not long after, all of a sudden one day, this feeling of just deep peace flooded my body and just <clears throat> took my breath away. And I had a knowing I was going to live and I wasn't alone. Wonderful. And what did you learn facing your death again, having an NDE in your 30s? Interestingly, after I, I mean, i grateful, I got through all the treatments and um, fast forward, went through high school, college, my family, all of them in business. So I went into business. I was with actually Time Magazine. I was selling advertising and on a timing corporate trip, we went whitewater rafting in Costa Rica. And that's when I had um, a near-death experience. It was treacherous waters. And, um, you know, I was on this raft. Next thing you know, I'm deep underwater with a life vest and helmet. And I just was, you know, here I am, I'm going to die. And I had flashbacks in that moment of seeing myself as a child in the hospital. And 
this white light came around my body and this voice crystal clear said living or dying is fine. And again, this peace came through my body and I just let go. I didn't know it was going to happen, but I let go. I came up from out of underneath one of the rapids and, and I survived. And it was really a turning point in my life um, in that I, at the time, as I said, I was working for Time Magazine. I realized like, this isn't it. This isn't what I want to do. This isn't where I'm feeling called. I had been feeling this nudging my being. And I thought I need to create space to listen to where I'm being called. So I gave my notice. And within a few weeks, I actually left Time Inc. to start listening, like, where am I being called? So it was another deepening of what it means to be alive, feeling that deep peace in our being, feeling like I'm not alone and trusting and listening into where am I being guided. And tell us about what you pursued and became after leaving time. <laughs> it was just a series of, interestingly, listening, hearing, nudgings. I committed and I, I've had a steeped prayer practice since a child. Um, but after the leaving timing, I carved out time every day, prayer, meditation, journaling. And a few months into, I was picked up some different jobs. Um, a girlfriend late at night said, have you ever thought of studying theology, spiritual direction? No one in my family lineage has ever gone to theology ministry school. So that's what I did. I, it's just like, oh, I never thought of that. And I applied, got into graduate theology and then divinity school. I just, I kept feeling and sensing these nudgings. I think we can all experience it if we come into the moment and listen within. So it's just a series of graduate school, becoming then actually a chaplain, which I honestly was kind of against of like, oh, I vowed as a child, I'd never step foot in a hospital again. And then I kept getting this nudging chaplain, chaplain, and becoming a minister to my path to this day, I feel like has really been led every step of my path. It's interesting. I had shared with you before we started recording the interview that I've had a number of synchronicities in my life, which also led me on a spiritual path. And what I learned with these synchronicities is if I heard something and it sort of resonated with me, I had three choices. I could either dismiss it out of hand. I could say, yeah, that's interesting, but not right now, perhaps later. Yeah. Or I could say yes with a capital Y. <laughs> and every time that capital Y came out of my mouth, the next synchronicity came and the next one came. Have you experienced that flow also? Completely, yes. I mean, when... when my girlfriend, Connie, late at night mentioned studying theology, spiritual direction. I hadn't thought of it, even though I, since a child, since a teenager, I've been reading books on life and meaning and purpose and why are we here on this earth? And she had mentioned St. Catherine University, and I, I got information from all the different universities in the Twin Cities. When I held in my hands the information on graduate theology school from St. Catherine, my body started physically shaking. It was just a knowing this is it. And then, yeah, every step I feel has been guided, not always interestingly, not always maybe what my mind would choose, but just a feeling in my body. So so even chaplaincy, applying to the different chaplaincy residency programs, I got into all of them here in the Twin Cities. I was grateful for that. And I really tuned in and prayed like, which graduate school? And I kept getting University of Minnesota, which is called University of Minnesota Fairview now. But I kept getting that. And I thought, no, that's where I was a patient, a, a child patient there. And But I kept pushing, getting that nudging. And that's where I went. Yep. You know, I had mentioned to you that I had a long career, 44-year career in industrial technology and sales, and that my calling, which happened in my mid to late 30s and then going on further, led me to the New Seminary of New York. And my reason for going there was that in those days, if you wanted to go into a hospital and do laying on of hands, Reiki was my practice, uh, you either had to be a licensed massage therapist or ordained in a faith where that was considered one of the sacraments. And obviously, having a full-time position, I could not take two years to go <laughs> off to go to massage school. But through this wonderful synchronicity about going to the new seminary, I was ordained. And then when 9-11 when came along, uh, my wife, who also was a graduate of that school, uh, decided to volunteer as a chaplain for the Red Cross. And when I got back from a business trip that very week, I was 
out in Montana when 9-11 happened. That Friday, I returned, and the following day, I joined her, and we both became chaplains for the Red Cross, taking care of families at the Family Assistance Center in, in New York City, waiting for word of their loved ones who were either uh, missing or, or had no word, or those that had already known that their loved ones were gone. And it was one of the most beautiful, life-changing experiences I've ever had, and I'm grateful for that opportunity, and had I not... <laughs> listen to the synchronicities, I wouldn't have been present for those folks. Mm, that's amazing. That's a great story. <laughs> Absolutely. Have you met and worked with others who have experienced this change? Oh, absolutely. When you really take time, and I share this in my new book, Everyday Awakening, but with my clients over the years, when you take time to get out of your fast chattering, busy ego mind, right, that we all have that can run our life to just come into this moment to feel into just here and now be here. And now we move out of our busy mind. That's when we start to sense and feel and hear that guidance. And so I'd say many colleagues, many friends that are open and want to keep going inward and learning and growing. This is the path and this is, I believe, how you do it. <laughs> and we're going to be discussing Everyday Awakening shortly, but tell us about your ability and your experiences connecting with guides and angels. After, through my chaplaincy program, then I became a chaplain at first a long-term care center. Then I was a chaplain at our level one trauma hospital, Hennepin County Medical Center, and then a hospice chaplain, Fairview Hospice, for quite a number of years. It was in my chaplaincy work, starting at Hennepin County Medical Center and then Fairview Hospice. I was with thousands of people at the end of life in crisis at the trauma hospital, but in hospice people at end of life who, um, who died. And it was such a privilege. It was such an honor to be with people. And when I was with people dying, I could feel and sense my vision had opened up. I could sense and feel the energy in the room, spirits in the room. When people would leave their body, I could feel their spirit leave their body and be in the room often just hovering way up above, in, for example, a bedroom. And then I had many people as a hospice chaplain in particular, who within days to a week after they died, they would come back and see me in the middle of the night, I would open my eyes and like, zoom, there they would be an outline of their spirit. And I always felt like a nodding of like thankfulness, gratitude, and then they'd be gone. Uh, and it just opened up in me just there's so many more layers of reality between our physical body and the spirit world. And the other lesson, really, I feel deeply from my experiences is that death is not an end. We transform, we go on. Um, it was a big learning. Absolutely. And I'm not, I haven't been a formal uh, chaplain in hospice, but I have served others in hospice. And I've experienced many times when people who are ready to leave start seeing their relatives appearing. Have you had that same experience? With many, many, many people. Yes. In hospice. Yes. Um, in fact, it was just fascinating companioning, walking with people the last weeks, days of their life, even the last days I would have, I'm just thinking of a particular patient right name. His name was Bob who started to leave his body and he saw his father and a loved one. I think it was his brother who had died and he was talking to them, but then he came back. He's like, I'm not quite ready yet. And he would come back in his body and the next day we were visiting and he told me about it. Um, but I heard this with many people, yes. And it's got to be reassuring for those who are about to transition to know that they're being welcomed. I would say absolutely. It, and it depends on, I think, how open you are. But what I did find in the years I worked as a chaplain with Fairview Hospice is the norm was people were found a sense of peace and acceptance. Maybe it was not till the last few days, but they did. And they founded peace before they left. I'll tell you the opposite is being a chaplain at Hennepin County Medical Center. That was high trauma. That was a little different where one, you know, in the afternoon, the person's alive. 
An hour later, they're in an extreme car accident, and then they're dying an hour later. And that's a different kind of death. Um, but in general, in particular with hospice, there was a deep peace and acceptance. And it was unusual that people didn't find that peace at the end when they were ready to leave their body. And was it comforting for family members who were with them at the time waiting for their transition? It was. In, in again, in hospice, it was. My role as a chaplain was helping the patient find the deep peace in their being before they were ready to leave their body, but also family members and how if there was anything left to be said or any levels of needing forgiveness, just helping collaborate a conversation and connection so that it was a healing for everyone involved. And again, a little different at the level one trauma hospital where there wasn't time. It just, there wasn't that time to process such a sudden death. So that was definitely more in the field of trauma um, that then would need to be worked on after the person died for the family members that survived a traumatic death of a loved one. Which I'm sure is why you share in your ministry, and I've shared in mine, that tomorrow is never guaranteed. If you've hurt someone, ask for forgiveness. If you feel that you have been hurt by them, offer forgiveness and also say, I love you while you can do it. Absolutely. We can all heal and do our own deep healing work. And it's a choice. It's a choice. It's a practice. It's a consciousness to be aware that, oh, I still have this grievance in my heart or this grudge or just to have that awareness, self-awareness. I share with people, awareness is the first step of all healing, but being able to tune in, how am I not at peace? What is that unease? What needs to be forgiven to then consciously bring it into your front of your brain, to process it, to feel it, to find that deep healing, and we can all heal. Absolutely. It's interesting that in the ancient Egyptian pantheon, you had Mat, who was the goddess of truth. And when you died, your heart was put on a scale on one side, and Mat's feather was put on the other side. And if Mat's feather was lighter or it was heavier than your heart, then your heart was free. But it was obviously the opposite. You still had some work to do before going into the afterlife. That is so fascinating. I do. This is my opinion, but I think the reason we are all here on this earth is to learn to love. I think learning how to love, love ourselves, love one another. I think what we take with us when we die is our ability to love. 100%. Thank you for saying that. I, I can't agree with you more. Thank you. <laughs> what inspired your book, Everyday Awakening, Five Practices for Living Fully? feeling deeply, and coming into your heart and soul. I saw a vision of my book, not surprising because I am a mystic and intuitive. I saw it over 10, 10 years ago. Then my children were teenagers and my husband, I just, it came to me. I saw this vision. I'm going to be writing a book. And I then told my family and they all said, great, mom. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> But then I I just started, I had this urge, internal urge, again, listening, feeling the guidance. I started writing in a journal and then I started blog writing. And it was actually the beginning of when the pandemic happened and we had to be extra careful because my husband has a rare heart condition. So we had to be very careful. And my life became pretty limited and small. I mean, I luckily transitioned my whole client practice on Zoom, but uh, I had more time. So I just felt this nudging. I sat down at night, usually eight, nine o'clock, and I would pray or meditate for a little bit. And then I would sit at the computer and it just poured out of me. I write, I would write night after night, week after week. And my whole book, it was, it just, I had to write it. It was a calling. In Everyday Awakening, you share that awakening is a profound experience, but it is not mysterious or esoteric. Please explain. I think feeling into when I say awakening, the preciousness of life right now, feeling into our heart, our soul. I think our heart is the doorway to our soul. It's about feeling what it means to be alive right now, that preciousness of life and aliveness we all can feel. In fact, I think everyone hearing this right now 
have had moments of sense of awe or wonder if it's watching you know a sunset over a lake or listening to the wind through the trees or birds singing where it just time stops you're like oh, here i am and i'm alive and we all can choose to awaken into this heart of our, the love in our heart and soul and that sense of oneness with the universe and it's a practice. It's a choice. It's a practice. I think there's several ways. One way how I experienced this was through crisis and upheaval. And my message with my book is you don't have to wait until you're at the end of your life or you're in crisis. You can choose right now. I was with many patients at the end of life who for a few moments, even before they died, they're like, oh, this is it. This is life. And then they died. So I think we, if, if anyone listening right now, you feel like a nudging, you're wanting more. It's about doing the inner work, listening, finding that sense of deep presence. And that's why I have five practices of how can you do this? How can you experience and feel into your heart and soul? And we'll talk more about that in our next segment. I had a wonderful spiritual teacher at the New Seminary of New York back in the 1990s. Gentleman was well into his 80s, and he would tell us that in the morning he'd wake up and he'd have pain in his legs and pain in his back and pain in his arms, and he'd say, thank you, God. And people would say, you're in pain. Why are you saying thank you? He said, because I'm alive, and every day I'm alive, I have purpose. What a wonderful teaching. That's so beautiful. And that is actually how I start my day habit every morning for so many years. The, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is thank you, a gratitude. I'm I'm alive. Wow. <laughs> I'm alive. I have a bed to sleep in. I have family. I have friends. So I think about the thankfulness and then I feel it. I feel love, gratitude vibrating in my body. Love, gratitude, highest vibrational energy we can hold in our body. And I feel it coursing through my body. I have a few prayers and I just see the flow of my day. That's how I start my day every single morning. And I'll share with you the opposite of that is, and I think a lot of people do this, you wake up and you might grab your phone or you start thinking about, I have this and this and this appointment and this appointment. And you're already in a stress response before you get out of bed. You're already running cortisol hormone in your body before you get out of bed. So again, mindfully, how are you choosing to live your day? Amen. My guest is Catherine Duncan. Her book is called Everyday Awakening, Five Practices for Living Fully, Feeling Deeply, and Coming into Your Heart and Soul. Catherine, please share with our listeners where they can find out more about you and your book. My website is everydayawakening.com. I, my book is on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I'm all over social media, Instagram, Catherine Duncan, M-A-B-C-C, -C, TikTok is the same. On Facebook, I'm Learning to Live is my company name. So easy to find. <laughs> and we'll be back with more of Catherine after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. The cutting edge of conscious radio. OM Times Radio. IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Catherine Duncan. Her book, Everyday Awakening, Five Practices for Living Fully, Feeling Deeply, and Coming into Your Heart and Soul. Catherine, what does it mean to live fully and awaken? I think being awakened, awakened into our heart and soul, living not in our mind, not head up, but in the depth of our heart, our soul, this essence of love and oneness with the world, we can all experience this. And it's a choice. It's a practice. As I was saying a little bit earlier, you don't have to wait until a crisis or facing death or end of life. You can start choosing, and these are the practices I have in my book, choosing to feel the preciousness of being alive right now. Is this a personal choice, or do you have to go through some great upheaval in your life? 
I think there's several paths to awakening into your essence, your heart and soul. One path can be through crisis. Yes. And that is my path is maybe not as common, but at 11, 12 years old, seeing that I was walking on a tightrope between life and death cracked me open. Uh, so I've heard that from people that have gone through crisis, all of a sudden just they have a whole new lens of what it looks like to be and feel to be alive right now. I've also worked with many people in my practice who they may have done, you know, had a career, been really successful, even as, say, a doctor or an, a, an attorney, an executive, but they feel something's missing. They feel numb. They feel a gnawing and nudging. Uh, or even I work with many women like, this is it. Is this really life? Um, and that's how they start to look inward to open into their heart and soul. Another group I would say are people that are on the path and maybe they've had for years a steep yoga practice or meditation practice. And there's just a deepening happening within them. But a big message I just want to share is that it is a conscious choice how every one of us is living each day. We're either opening and growing and feeling more into what it means to be here on this earth and the sense of aliveness, or many of us, I think, live on autopilot where life is living us, our mind is living us. And I just invite the people listening right now, how are you choosing to live? Absolutely. Talk a little bit more about that. How, how do they identify or how do they look at this and go through that evaluation process? I would invite people, and I do this in my private practice, to start tuning in how you're living your day. Even tuning in, are you in your mind all day? It's so easy, again, I think. Um, and I think the world really supports this, you know, about being bright and being in our mind and living at such a fast pace. But if you tune in during the day, can you notice, do you have moments, minutes, or practicing where you take a break from your mind. Maybe you get out in nature and go for a walk. And when I say go for a walk, I'm not going for a walk with a podcast. You know, I'm you're like really present in nature. Do you take some moments in your day? Some people actually it's through exercise. It's through a yoga practice. It's through a breath practice, a meditation practice. There's so many different ways, but where your mind that's so powerful can slow down where you can just feel into here and now this moment because it's in this moment where that deep peace and that ease, that's where it is. It's not in our mind. And that's the first of the five practices you offer in Everyday Awakening, being in the present moment. For those people who say, I can't meditate, I, I, don't, I can't uh, calm down, I can't just uh, enjoy and be in the presence of nature and everything around me, what do you say to those folks? I, so I might lead them in a breath exercise well, there are many different ways to practice breathing. One of my all-time favorites is just taking a minute and breathing in, imagining peace coming through the top of your head, through your body, all the way down through your legs, your knees, and breathing out through your feet. Any stress, any unrest, you could even visualize it like gray smoke leaving your body. That's one of my favorite go-tos. Here's another example, practicing moments of mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Just being present fully in this moment. So an example would be, and this is something I do a lot, in the morning, let's say you drink coffee or tea. Let's say coffee. You go in your kitchen, you make coffee, you pour yourself a cup of coffee. So for about one minute without the TV, the radio, your phone, your computer, you know, there's so many distractions. None of those are on. You hold your cup of coffee you feel the heat of the coffee mug, you smell the aroma, you take a sip, you're fully present for a minute, just drinking your coffee. Maybe you have a window, you look out the window, you see birds flying by, you're just present for a minute drinking your coffee. That's a really beginning level, just start with that, see how that feels, just being present while you're drinking coffee in the morning and notice how that feels. So many people have left their faith and are searching for more. What perspectives can you offer people that are searching and struggling? And why is it important to connect with something greater? 
I share with many people I work with and in my talks that I give just some understanding around the words religion and spirituality. And yes, I'm a minister. Um, in my background, I'm very inclusive and a liberal minister. But when I think of religion, I think of it as more you know, man-made um, doctrine, dogma, how you practice a tradition. And some of the current research on this is what, 20% of the, the U.S. people in the U.S. go to church. I like the word spirituality. What does spirituality mean? What gives you meaning? So just tuning in on a daily basis, what gives you meaning? What gives you life? What gives you a sense of peace and joy? And leaning into that, um, I think, is really important in life-giving and finding, when you say community, um, having a sense of community, having people that you connect with, and it may be around spirituality. I mean, even just deciding, um, you know, I want to meet a friend for coffee instead of over the phone, or maybe you like to go play basketball, or just a sense of community is so important, especially right now while we're in what's called the loneliness epidemic. One out of two people in the U.S. are lonely, and one of the antidotes is community. And here's the research. When you have one or two authentic friends that you can really share with, you live longer. Community is so important. One of the greatest lessons I learned while attending Interfaith Seminary in the mid-1990s was that there's an iteration of the golden rule in virtually every faith. How may we use this to embody love and compassion? As I said earlier, I think the reason we're here, I think we're spirit in a body for a short time, and then we go on. But I think we're here to learn how to love. I think love is the healing balm. I think love is the greatest healer. And at the end of the day, um, I think love, kindness, the golden rule, do unto another as you do unto them. I just, I think that is the true healing and, and love and kindness always wins. I'm guessing everyone hearing this right now has had experiences around if it's a family member, a friend, a colleague, who is maybe not kind, not thoughtful. We all have had these experiences and I have too. And what I have found in my life is love and kindness always wins. It just, over time, someone who's not nice to you, you treat them well. And, you know, I'm, I'm with the caveat, if it's an abusive relationship, you have to have boundaries and potentially walk away. But kindness always wins. It's the greatest healer. And people can heal when they're around you. If you're embodying love and light, it has a effect around everyone who's around you when you hold and embody love. I've had situations where I've been with a group of people and one of my friends, and the friend has disagreeable. And sitting at a dinner table being disagreeable, and everyone gets up and walks away. And I would embrace this person and hug him and say, I love you anyway. I love you as you are. And he would start crying. And that promoted healing. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. When you can embody love and kindness amidst being around people that maybe you don't agree with what they're saying or you don't agree with their behavior. My experience is just what you experience is that people can open and soften because they can feel that love and that kindness. I had an experience working in healthcare, one of the healthcare groups I worked with as a chaplain. And you would think, for example, in chaplaincy, the teams, nurses, social workers, the groups that you work with, they, they would just naturally embody love, right? Because you're with people that are end of life. It's really life and death situations. And surprisingly, like in all areas of career, careers, there are people that maybe they are going through hardship or a tough time or that aren't necessarily kind. But I, I had a couple challenging colleagues and I just embodied love and kindness. And guess what? They ended up slowly shifting and changing. And it was a tremendous healing for all of us. And the other aspect is something that many of us have been sharing since the advent of COVID, which is acts of radical kindness going out of your way 
to be grateful, to thank people for their service, to offer your service to those who need assistance and help perhaps in shopping or doing something else. Just a, a smile as you pass someone on the street, a good morning, a good evening, how are you? Simple things like that will change a person's attitude. I agree. And I think that's very powerful. I practice this popping into the grocery store and sometimes a checkout clerk might be just very cool or aloof or maybe not even kind. Maybe they're not nice. And I'll just look at them and say, how are you today? And it's just amazing when you can give someone some kindness, some attention, how they can just open and soften. And one more example, I was shopping one time and there was a very long line at the checkout and this uh, much older woman came with her basket and she looked dismayed as she saw so many people online. And I went out of my way to let everyone in the line know that I'm giving her my space. I said, please take my space. Everybody turned around and looked at me and I walked around to the end of the line to give her. That changed her, her whole affect for that day. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. <laughs> I love and, that. And it's so simple. It's something we all can do. There's no, there's no, it doesn't cost us anything except to open our hearts and give love. Mm -hmm. I have a dear friend. In fact, I write about her in my book. Her name is Lori. And she just embodies love to a level I don't see very often where we'll, she's in Chicago. She's a part-time actress and she comes in town to visit and we'll walk her on one of the downtown lakes. And she says hi to almost everyone. And there's just this warmth streaming from her. And it's so beautiful just to even witness the warmth from her and then how people soften as they feel that warmth come over them. Another practice that you offer in everyday awakening is growing our trust. With mm -hmm. so much misinformation being shared in both traditional and social media, how do we do this? In I'm a huge self-help reader since a child, and I've read so many books where they say trust, trust, but they don't tell you how. So I really pushed myself in writing this this particular chapter, how do you trust? So here's how I think truly we can trust. And that is first starting with coming into the present moment, being here now. When we're coming to the moment, then it's practicing acceptance. And boy, that's easy to say, you know, it can be really hard to accept the moment, especially with how messy life can be. But can you just accept in the moment what's happening, the good, the bad, just accepting the moment when you can drop in and accept and surrender into the moment? That's when I think we can listen. We can, what they say, listen with the ear of our heart, just that listening, listening, hearing, sensing, feeling. We all have these abilities. So we listen and that's where we can tune in. And that's how we trust. Trust is an active verb. It's by being in the present moment, accepting the moment, listening, and then you start to feel and get a sense like, yeah, I am on track or no, I'm not on track or that inner guidance within every one of us arises and gives you information and guidance and will give you a sense of truly how you can trust how your path is unfolding. I've been blessed as you have with guidance, spiritual guidance, and many times in my life, listening to that inner voice and recognizing that what I'm, what's being shared with me is important for me and those I love, I followed that guidance to the T. A quick example, several years ago, I was driving with my wife and son on a local highway. We were in the extreme left lane. Traffic was moving at the speed limit. There was no indication of anything wrong. And the voice came and said, get out of this lane now. It didn't shout at me. It spoke reassuringly and lovingly, but I always listened. I moved from the left lane to the center lane. Within 10 seconds, there was a major accident in the left lane. And had I not listened, we would have in the middle of that accident. That's amazing. And I also get a lot of guidance like that as well. And my comment to share in the moment is that I do believe everyone listening can open into this guidance. Some of us, it might be hearing, like how you heard and I hear guidance. It might be hearing what they call as clear audience, or it might be seeing, which is called clairvoyance or clairsention. But you can't access that when you're in your busy mind. It's when you come into the moment, feeling into just here and now, 
that that is where that guidance resides. My guest is Catherine Duncan. Her book, Everyday Awakening, Five Practices for Living Fully, Feeling Deeply, and Coming into Your Heart and Soul. We'll be back with more after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4pm Pacific Time, 7pm Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, Thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Join me every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Own Times Radio for Vox Novus, the new voice. If I could be you. And you could be me. For just one hour. If you could find a way. To get inside. Each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Catherine Duncan. We're talking about her book, Everyday Awakening, Five Principles for Living Fully, Feeling Deeply, and Coming into Your Heart and Soul. Catherine, what have you learned about the meaning of life when you've companioned so many people as they died? I think it's about how do you live today this moment can you feel into the preciousness of being alive i do think being alive is a gift it's such a gift and often i think many of us don't really feel how it's such a gift until something happens or maybe you start getting older and you start also now reflecting but I think to feel like that, that wonderment, that preciousness, that I think the core of our essence is love. I think we're all connected through this love and this oneness. And it's like, ah, it's here right this moment for every one of us to experience if you want, if you choose, and it's a practice. Aside from uh, the this topic we discussed before about asking for forgiveness or offering forgiveness, is there anything that has come up amongst those that you've been in hospice with that they had wished they had done in their life? I, he- I, I've heard a lot with people at the very end of life realizing that what's most important is love, love of family, love of friends, everything else drops away. Um, And I'll share with you, I experienced this with my mother-in-law 20 years ago, and this was a turning point for me, a turning me, again, listening to becoming a chaplain. Her life was really externally focused, material things and shopping and just outside um, distractions, you know, that we all can get caught in. And she was suddenly diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and there was nothing they could do. She lived 
a year and she just opened and blossomed and all that dropped away and all that really mattered was her dear family, her close friends, feeling love, feeling into the preciousness of life. I witnessed it in front of my eyes and it was beautiful. It was just, I, it was awe-inspiring, soul-shaping to walk with her on that path. And I did see that with quite a number of people that I companion and walked with in hospice that all the years that they worked or they spent so much time just worrying or fretting and just really realizing that it's just about enjoying the moment right now with the ones you love. I'll share one personal experience with you. This has to be with, it happens to be with my mother. Uh, she transitioned in January of 2020 and my sister and I were with her at the time. And one of the things that uh, was very special to her, she truly loved my, my father. She, he died when I was 15 and she did eventually remarry. But my father was the love of her life. And back in those days, there was a song called Honey by Bobby Goldsboro. And the song said, honey, I miss you, and I'm being good, and I long to be with you if only I could. And mm -hmm. the day my sister called me and she said, this is it, and we were standing by her bedside, and she was unconscious. And I said, mom, I said, if you look, you'll see daddy's waiting for you, and he's singing a song to you. And honey, I miss you, and I'm being good, and I'd long to be with you if only I could. And her breathing changed, her affect changed, and she passed very shortly thereafter. That was a gift. It was a gift for, for my family, for my sister, myself, for my brother also, who wasn't there at that exact moment, but was there. And, 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 and also the understanding that we can call out to our family who has gone before, and ask them to join us and comfort us. That is just beautiful, beautiful. I had a similar experience when I was with my father when he died. I was the only one in the bedroom. There was a nurse in the very corner. All my siblings, everyone was out of the bedroom. And I just, he was unconscious. And I just, in my mind, like, I'm ready. I said, it's okay, dad. I thought that in my mind. And then all of a sudden, this huge wave of energy came through the bedroom. It was just remarkable, magical. My dad turned his head, opened his eyes and whoop, left. And it was just awe-inspiring. It wasn't, I thought I'd be scared because it was my father dying and we were very close, but it wasn't. It was just beautiful. It was just un unbelievably beautiful and peaceful. And annoying that people come and help us when we were ready to leave our body. I think it was angels, spirit guides, they all were there helping, boom, helping my father leave and transition. Both of us have the experience of knowing what it is to give true listening to those that were called to serve. And a poem came through me a few years ago about this. May I share that with you? Oh, I'd love to hear. It's called The Gift of True Listening. There often are words that need to be heard without cutting in or positioning. Your heart will be stirred and compassion conferred as you offer the gift of true listening. You'll create sacred space while bestowing great grace with love all around you glistening. It may be any place where a soul you embrace as you offer the gift of true listening. So gift someone near you by saying, I hear you, lifting them up with your christening. And one day when you're due, you'll be heard too, receiving the gift of true listening. Oh, that's beautiful. That's Thank beautiful. You. That's the core tenets of my training as a spiritual director, as a chaplain. How, do, how can you just be a listening presence? Just presence, fully present in the moment. Absolutely. Catherine, in this stress-filled world, what would you offer listeners to calm the nervous system and reset the brain? We now know that we can, every one of us, self-regulate. We can calm our nervous system. And this was revolutionary research back in the 70s. Dr. Herbert Benson, Harvard professor and doctor who coined the term relaxation response and working with your breath five minutes, just breathing in, breathing out, five minutes of a meditation 
If you do five minutes, it lowers physiologically, changes your body, calms your nervous system, lowers your blood pressure, your heart rate, your cortisol level. Every one of us can work with this to calm our body. There's also somatic body movements. And I, I have 42 exercises in my book. So my book isn't just theory, but how do you do it? How do you find love and flow and peace? Is it a body exercise? Is it working breath, meditation, um, working with energy? There's just many different ways of how every one of us can tap into, tune into, and embody that peace and that ease that is truly our true nature. Please share with us some of the other modalities that you use in your practice. I do a lot of teaching just basics of different breath exercises, um, meditating, working with your body, working with a self-soothing practice, um, working with your voice, like toning. I'm trained in EFT, emotional freedom technique. I'm also steeped in energy healing. I'm certified in Reiki and healing touch. Um, one quick comment in the moment that has been life-changing for me, a modality, and I have it in my book, is working with energy, energy boundaries of the world. There's a lot of chaos in the world. There's a lot of unease in the world. So people listening right now, if any of you feel a little more sensitive, you don't even have to be empathic, but where you can feel a lot, maybe you pop into a grocery store and you can kind of feel the unease, just conscious of how you work with energy and energy boundaries. A couple quick examples of visualizing as far as you extend your arms is your whole energy field and seeing it like a, a bubble, an eggshell where the energy hits the sides and drops away um, or mirrors on the outside or I'll just set my intention. But it is amazing how we can all feel more grounded if we consciously work with this. And what I'm telling you about energy boundaries right now in this moment, some people might think, oh, kind of woo woo. But here's the thing, the number one medical textbook in the United States for integrative medicine called Integrative Medicine by David Rakel. And my colleague and I wrote a chapter in that, the latest edition, there is a section on what I'm talking about. And I share that because this is now being accepted by doctors, the medical field nationwide. So that's just one quick snippet. But even working with energy has given me and so many people I've shared this with just more grounding, more peace, where that chaos of the world, you're present, but you're not taking it in and it's not dysregulating your body. Many of us, myself included, uh, had a reaction to the M5 solar flares a few weeks back. Did you? Were you affected by that? You know, actually, I I wasn't, but it may also be because of my daily practices. I mean, I start the morning with gratitude before I even start my day. I mindfully work with energy and energy boundaries through the day, and even. At night, um, when I go to sleep, because I can tune in and sense and see and experience so much of the spirit world, spirits and angels, I actually even work with some energy at night just so I can sleep well. So maybe that might be a reason that I didn't notice it as much. Mm, that's wonderful. Tell us a little more about EFT. Emotional freedom technique, it's a modality where you tap on eight key acupressure points. I trained with a woman here locally who trained with the founder, and it's really a powerful modality to clear, to clear in your body heavy negative if it's like you're stuck in a state of fear or anxiety or anger, these heavy feelings. And it's there's a lot out there about emotional freedom technique, how I've learned and with the woman I trained who trained with the founder is you get in touch with what is that number one feeling. You tap on the eight key acupressure points, feeling that feeling to clear it. And you only use words if it accentuates the feeling, but it's a very powerful modality to clear heavy emotions out of your body. What would you like readers to take away from Everyday Awakening, Five Practices for Living Fully, Feeling Deeply, and Coming into Your Heart and Soul? I would invite everyone listening to just tune in, to look inward, to how are you living your life every day? Are you able to live in a place of peace, 
calmness, equanimity. Granted, yes, life has curves and ups and downs, but just is that is that your anchor? Is it not? Or are you finding, which is so human, to live in your mind, live in a place of a lot of worry, unrest. We almost call it like we're in we're in a limbic loop. You keep thinking and worrying, and you know what we what we're thinking that affects the emotions, then the feelings. It's just can be a whole circle. So every one of us can choose to tune into and to grow that peace and that love that we are to feel into it, to love from there, to that be your anchor. And I invite you just to ask, how are you choosing to live? And it's possible to feel peace and ease and that deep sense of aliveness right now. My guest, Catherine Duncan. Catherine, one more time, please share with our listeners where they can find out more about you, your work, and your book. Yeah, my book, Everyday Awakening, and my website, everydayawakening.com. And I my book is on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. My um, On social media, Instagram is Catherine with a C, Catherine Duncan, M-A-B-C-C. That's my name on TikTok. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, the same name. And all over Facebook, it's actually my company name, Learning to Live. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experience and your wisdom. A delight to talk with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week.